Dear Patriots, before the news starts, please, subscribe to our patriotic channel by clicking the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up to this video. Don't forget to leave your opinion below in the comments section. Share the news on Facebook and Twitter so you friends see it. Thank you. Brown suggests Trump's sanctuary suit against California driven by fear of Mueller probe. Governor Jerry Brown of California suggested on Wednesday that pressure related to special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation of potential ties between the Trump campaign and Russia contributed to the Trump administration's decision to file a lawsuit challenging new California laws protecting immigrants. Speaking to reporters in Sacramento just after Attorney General Jeff Sessions touted the new lawsuit in a speech there. Brown indicated that the suit was the result of desperation on Sessions' part to counteract the headlines from the Mueller inquiry. Let's face it, the Trump White House is under siege. Mueller is closing in. There are more indictments to come, Brown said, without explaining the basis for his prediction. So, obviously, the attorney general has found it hard just to be a normal attorney general. He's been caught up in the whirlwind of Trumpism. Brown also speculated that Sessions' appearance at a law enforcement gathering in California was intended to boost his standing with President Donald Trump himself. I do think this is pure red meat for the base, and I would assume, this is pure speculation, that Jeff thinks that Donald will be happier with him and Donald will be tweeting his joy at this particular performance, said the governor, a Democrat and frequent critic of the administration. The suit filed on Tuesday night in federal court in Sacramento, seeks to invalidate three California laws by asserting that they interfere with federal immigration enforcement. Justice Department lawyers argue that the so-called sanctuary legislation defies the Constitution's supremacy clause by intruding on a policy area Congress has comprehensively regulated. Brown also invoked Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election comparing Sessions' lawsuit and his speech to those attempts to influence American politics. It's about dividing America, the governor said. There's been a lot of concern about people foreign people trying to sow division and discord. Now, we have the attorney general doing precisely that. Flanked by California's attorney general, Xavier Becerra, Brown repeatedly accused Sessions of lying during his presentation including by asserting that immigration authorities were being blocked from picking up immigrants at California jails and prisons. The governor sought to buttress his accusations of dishonesty by invoking the series of convictions Mueller has obtained of individuals who admitted to lying to investigators. We've seen in the Trump administration, with the investigations going on, pleas of guilty to lying, countless individuals, colleagues. So, there it is, Brown said. We know the Trump administration is full of liars. They've pled guilty, already, to the special counsel. So far, only one former Trump administration official has pleaded guilty in the Mueller investigation, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. He is awaiting sentencing after admitting in December to making false statements to the FBI. Two former Trump campaign advisors, Rick Gates and George Papadopoulos, have also entered guilty pleas to lying and are cooperating with Mueller. In addition, Alex van der Svaan, a Dutch attorney, pleaded guilty last month to lying to Mueller's team. He's not known to have any connection to the Trump administration or campaign. Paul Manafort, a former Trump campaign chairman, has been charged by Mueller's prosecutors with lying to the Justice Department about his Ukraine-related work. He has pleaded not guilty and is scheduled to go trial on those charges in September. Asked for comment on Brown's remarks, a justice official pointed to tweets from DOJ spokeswoman Sarah Isker Flores. She tweeted, The Attorney General didn't create this issue. But he cannot accept unconstitutional interference with federal law enforcement from any state. That is why this lawsuit was filed and that is why we expect to win. Republicans' last hope to flip Trump on tariffs spins. In public, Vice President Mike Pence is loudly praising his boss proposed tariffs on steel and aluminum, while gently urging him to scale back the policy behind the scenes. Pence was in Council Bluffs, Iowa, this week, 
where he gave Trump a shout-out for a policy decision that alarmed legions of White House aides, including the vice president, a lifelong advocate of free markets and free trade. Whether it's in renegotiating NAFTA, or protecting our steel and aluminum industries, President Trump is always going to put American workers, American companies and American farmers first, Pence said in a speech touting the administration's tax reform. But back in Washington, the vice president has been among the legions of top administration officials pushing President Donald Trump to back off the sweeping protectionist plan he put forward during a March 1 meeting with industry executives. Pence, according to more than a half dozen White House and Capitol Hill aides, has been quietly delivering messages to the president from Republicans on the Hill, who have publicly opposed the tariffs plan set to be announced as early as Thursday though he's made sure to maintain a studiously neutral position, to the frustration of some who had hoped he would do more to exert influence over Trump. Throughout his time as vice president, Pence has been careful to air any disagreements with the president privately, scrupulously avoiding the sorts of public feuds that have damaged the standing of other top administration officials with Trump. At times, he has even kept his mouth shut behind closed doors, according to two senior administration officials declining to express his views when they are at odds with those of the president. A political adviser to one right-leaning outside group called his lack of engagement on tariffs a big-time disappointment, and said the feeling was shared among free-market Republicans. Pence's low-key approach means some are coming to view him as a weak vice president, compared by some Republicans, unfavorably, to President George H. W. Bush's number 2, Dan Quayle. But his hands-off style has endeared him to Trump, with whom Pence has avoided the sort of public clashes that led to the resignation earlier this week of his top economic adviser, Gary Cohn. It's not the vice president's job to publicly criticize the president's policies. Whatever Mike Pence might think about a particular policy, he's going to work as hard as he can to help implement the president's agenda, said Alex Conant who served as communications director and senior advisor to Marco Rubio during the 2016 presidential campaign. The firestorm Trump ignited over tariffs has put Pence, a former Indiana congressman who serves as a liaison between the White House and conservatives on Capitol Hill, in a delicate position, stuck between a president dead set on a policy outcome and Republican congressional leaders who are for the first time taking a firm public stand against the White House. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell told reporters there is a lot of concern among Republican senators that this could metastasize into a larger trade war, and House Speaker Paul Ryan publicly urged the president to take a more surgical and targeted approach to tariffs. The vice president fully supports the president's policy agenda and the VP's role as an honest broker should not be misconstrued as lobbying one way or another, Pence's office told Politico on Wednesday. Pence succeeded his good friend David McIntosh in Congress. Now the president of the Club for Growth, McIntosh has become one of the most outspoken opponents of the administration's tariff decision on the right, calling the policy an affront to economic freedom. As governor of Indiana, Pence was a tireless advocate for free trade. He urged the Indiana congressional delegation to support both Trade Promotion Authority and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Trump campaigned against. In the letter, Pence argued that reducing tariffs and other trade barriers so that Indiana businesses can enjoy increased market access and fairly compete on the world stage is something that Congress must do. Many administration officials, including Pence, would prefer to see tariffs targeted at specific countries, particularly China, rather than the across-the-board hikes on steel and aluminum Trump seems to be proposing that would affect allies like Canada and the European Union according to one White House official. The policy, which had not been written before Trump made his surprise announcement last week, has not yet been finalized. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said Wednesday that it would leave room for country-specific exemptions based on national security, including for Canada and Mexico. The anti-protectionist camp lost a crucial voice in the tariff battle when Cohn announced his resignation as director of the National Economic Council on Tuesday. But many of the president's allies, including Pence, are still urging him to pull back before the policy is implemented. I agree with his effort to stop unfair trading practices, I do, 
the free market economist Larry Kudlow, who is under consideration to replace Kohn as head of the National Economic Council, said of the president. I just think you have to be very careful how you do it. Go after China, they're the worst offenders. Kudlow said he thinks the tariffs, as currently formulated, will hurt the economy, and that he is holding out hope that White House aides, including Pence, will be able to scale them back. I think this stuff is irresolvable, he said. There's a lot between the lip and the cup here. Timing of Trump tariff announcements still up in the air. The timing of President Donald Trump's announcement of steep tariffs on steel and aluminum imports remained up in the air on Thursday as administration officials worked to complete the legal analysis of the proposal, according to administration officials. The White House had been tentatively planning for a 3.30 p.m. Thursday announcement and even invited steel and aluminum industry workers to attend. But an administration official told Politico late Wednesday that it was unlikely that the announcement would occur on Thursday because lawyers were still finalizing crucial paperwork required to put the tariffs into effect. The president on Thursday morning, however, appeared to muddle the situation after he tweeted that he was looking forward to 3.30 p.m. meeting today at the White House and referenced the need for tariffs. It remained unclear if this was a formal notice of the timing of the tariff announcement. A person familiar with the internal debate on the tariffs said the specifics of the final announcement were still being ironed out late Wednesday. Trump surprised even some senior aides last week when he announced that he would soon impose a 25% tariff on steel imports and a 10% tariff on aluminum imports. While many in the administration knew Trump was strongly in favor of hefty tariffs, lawyers and policy staff were not prepared to move forward so quickly. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders told reporters earlier Wednesday that the tariffs were on track to be issued this week. The White House declined to comment on the exact timing of the announcement. Amid mounting pressure from members of his own party, including congressional leadership, Trump has also signaled his openness to exemptions that would, at least temporarily, protect key allies from the effects of the tariffs. White House Trade Advisor Peter Navarro told Fox Business Network on Wednesday night that Trump would temporarily exempt Canada and Mexico from the tariffs as the United States continues negotiations over the North American Free Trade Agreement. The proclamation will have a clause that does not impose these tariffs immediately on Ontario, Canada and Mexico, Navarro said, adding that it'll give administration officials a chance to continue NAFTA negotiations with those countries. He said Canada and Mexico won't receive the tariffs if they and the United States can reach an agreement on renegotiating NAFTA. Tying the tariffs to NAFTA could complicate the legal underpinning the administration is using to levy the sanctions. The administration argues that the tariffs are necessary for national security reasons, an issue that is largely unrelated to the NAFTA talks. Navarro added the tariffs will go into effect 15 to 30 days after Trump signs documents greenlighting them. Trump's announcement last week that he would impose the tariffs set off a fierce lobbying campaign among Washington Republicans, who hoped to change the president's mind. Opponents of the tariffs fear they could harm the economy and damage U.S. relations with key allies. Many administration officials were under the impression that Trump would first announce separate tariffs on Chinese products as part of an investigation into allegations that the country is forcing American companies to transfer valuable technology to compete in the market. Senior officials had worked for months to lay the legal and economic groundwork for those tariffs. But Trump instead decided to move forward on the steel and aluminum tariffs, setting off a scramble across the administration. Trump has signaled in recent days that he also wants to move forward on the tariffs related to alleged Chinese intellectual property theft. Administration officials said those tariffs, and related investment restrictions, could be unveiled in the coming weeks. Nancy Cook contributed to this report.